So now what we want to move on to is talking about tandem exits. I'm going to give you a presentation on how to build a better exit. And tandem exits are an important part of what we do for a number of reasons. First off, I mentioned this earlier to you guys before lunch, incidents are always the logical conclusion of a series of illogical acts or decisions. It's always the summation of a bunch of bad decisions and a bunch of bad things happen, happening that lead to these incidents and accidents. A bad exit is no different. A bad exit doesn't just happen. It's not unlucky. It's not the roll of the dice. A bad exit is always the logical conclusion of the series of bad decisions we make in choosing on how we exit the aircraft. That's an important thing to, to keep in mind because I'm going to show you a video that's a terrible exit. But when we look at the video first time, it's going to look almost accidental. Like, how did this happen? But then when we go back and we address the exit by the mechanics of it, how do we exit an aircraft, you're going to see that by the time we exit the aircraft, the only outcome was the bad exit. <clears throat> well, why is this so important to us? As a tandem instructor, our primary skill set in exiting an aircraft is to set a drogue stable in a head-high orientation. Exit an aircraft, achieve stability, and set a drogue. That's the actual skydiving involved in being a tandem instructor. We call it tandem free fall. It's free fall without a drogue. It can last three seconds up to eight seconds. Typically it's five to six, but it's that time where we're actually using our skill set. We're flying our body and we're <coughs> setting a drogue and we're setting it clean into the relative wind. That little window, that three to eight seconds is the most critical part of your job because once the drogue is out, our job is basically done other than to maintain altitude awareness and attempt to achieve stability until it's time to deploy the parachute. Would you guys agree? Once the drogue's out, the majority of our challenge is over until deployment. Now, once the parachute opens, we have no idea what's going to happen. It all depends on how happy or unhappy our packers are with us. It depends on how well our maintenance program is at our drop zone. Once the parachute opens, all bets are off. We can't tell if we're going to get a line over, tension knot. Can't prepare for that. But all the other bad things that can happen up until deployment time, all the other bad incidents and accidents and all the emergencies that tandem instructors can face, 95% of them are exit related. So if we focus on our exits to building a better exit and exiting correctly, cleanly into the relative wind, we can eliminate 95% of the problems we're ever going to be faced as a tandem instructor. Is that a good trade-off? Would we rather have a good solid exit and have a really easy job once that exit's completed or exit just throwing ourselves out to the wind and seeing what happens and having to fight every exit and increasing our chances of a malfunction and in an incident by 95%? Nobody would want to do that because we get paid the same whether we work hard or work easy. So I'm going to use this video as an example. Anybody here ever been in a side spin? Okay, did you survive? Yes, everybody survived the side spins because you're still here, able to raise your hand. The side spin is just one illustration of how an exit can be blown. It's a simple concept, but it's something we have to understand. Tandem skydives start with tandem exits. When you guys were all trained, I'm going to assume that, like everywhere else in the world where we have great programs like the BPA, that you're trained to exit stable, head high into the relative wind and then set a drogue after you've achieved stability. But the reality is, despite the fact we have great training programs around the world, when people take a course, they pass the course, and then they go home. They go to their home drop zone. And things start happening. They learn the right way to do things, but then they start getting a little tired, a little lazy. Hand cam shows up, and hand cam destroys our ability to exit because our left hand, instead of being here, ends up down here. Next thing you know, we're rolling out of 182s, blue, green, blue, green, looking for blue, throwing a drogue, and sticking a hand cam in someone's face. The reason I offer you that is that a lot of the exits we see today from experienced instructors, they wouldn't pass the course that you took to earn your rating in the first place. And that's really something to think about. You learned the correct way to do it. We all have. But as trained professionals with ratings, we're not doing the things that we were trained to do. We have this process, I call it the new normal. We get away with things through laziness, through being tired, through trying to show off boredom, whatever you want to call it, and then that god-awful thing hand cam. 
all those different things that are out there that destroy our exit techniques. So what a, your homework assignment, it's a self-evaluation. Go home tonight and YouTube your exits. Go look at the videos and, and don't look at your own private stock. Go to YouTube specifically. That's in the public domain. That's where when there's accidents and we have to go back and investigate them, it's one of the first places we look. And what we're looking for is patterns. Someone that has an unstable drogue throw and a drogue gets wrapped around their leg. That's not an anomaly. It's not the first time it happened, the unstable drogue throw. We go back and we see 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 other what? Unstable drogue throws. And they get away with it over and over again until they don't get away with it. So we're all capable of improving and polishing our exits. So this is that moment of pause where you guys are going to go home tonight, reassess what you're doing. Ask yourself if the exits you're making today are the same technical exits that you were required to make during your tandem course. And if they're not, now is the time to change them. Now is the time to go back, go from the new normal, whatever that is today, whatever you're choosing to exit an aircraft with today. If it's not what you were trained to do when you first got your rating, now is the time to go back. Because the worst scenario in the world for us is investigating an accident or an incident where someone has a terrible exit, which results in an incident of injury or fatality. And we go back and we look and we see hundreds of videos in the public domain that anyone can see and find that show the same incorrect procedure, same bad exit over and over and over again that was never corrected. We don't correct them because we get away with them. The only problem is eventually we don't get away with it. And that's what we're trying to do is change it back to the original recipe from the new normal before we get to the point where we're in an accident or an incident. So the facts about bad exits. Bad body position in the door. That's what causes a bad exit. There's a level of fear in tandem instructors today. The fear is the fear of tandem free fall. That's the best part of our job, at least it should be. The three to eight seconds from exit to setting a drogue where we actually get to skydive. There is a number of instructors who are afraid of that. They're afraid of it because of side spins. They're afraid of it because of unstable drogue throws. Number of reasons to be afraid. We need to break the fear. We have confidence in ourselves. Lack of knowledge. Those three basic fundamentals I just talked to you about in that video. Student body position, instructor body position, and relative wind. So few instructors have that in their arsenal of information right now to know what those three things are and how to correct them in the door of the aircraft, which includes the relative wind presentation. Do we dive towards the wing or do we dive towards the relative wind? I told you hand cams have destroyed our industry as far as our exit techniques. I'll address that. And then we'll talk about jumpsuit selection, how that can make our job easier. So body position, what we see in the field, the arch students, students with their legs out, arms crossed. Different manufacturers have different requirements for the arms. If you're jumping a Sigma or Vector, our recommendation requirement is that the arms are on the same side of the harness. If we crisscross, we have a tendency to want to curve our spine in the wrong direction. Arms on the same side tend to promote curving our spine in the right direction. Students' heads are forward. Students are naturally inquisitive. They want to look at where they're going. If their eyes are looking towards the ground, where is their body going to go when you exit? They're going to look towards the ground. So the head placement of the student's body on your instructor's shoulder looking to the sky and not the ground will increase the chance of a stable exit. And the spine and shoulders of the student should be straight. We're not always going to see that student body position, but what we can do is fix it in the aircraft before we leave the plane. Which brings me to the most critical part of this presentation. If you forget everything else I told you, if you think I'm just making this stuff up as I go, that's okay. This one slide, I want to burn it into your brain. The concept of scanning, it's called SIPD. How many motorcyclists do we have in the room? You guys are already using this every day you get on a motorcycle and you're not even aware of it most likely. I'm driving down the road on a motorcycle. Wait, we're in the UK. I'm driving down the other side of the road on a motorcycle and I see at the intersection coming up, I see a big car coming about two miles down the road. Motorcyclists don't look right in front of them they look a mile ahead, right? We're scanning the horizon for what's to come. When we see a car coming to an intersection, what do we automatically assume subconsciously? They're gonna blow through that stop sign or that red light and they're gonna create a collision hazard. So without even thinking about it, we determine 
there's a potential for an issue ahead of us, we decide that the corrective action is to change lanes, then we execute that. We remove ourselves from that lane before we get to that intersection. I didn't make this up. I actually learned this 30 years ago in a motorcycle course. Use the same scanning technique for tandem skydiving, our exits. As we put ourselves in the door of an aircraft, we should be scanning our student's body, our body, and our orientation to the relative wind. We should be interpreting the outcomes. If my student's legs are out in front of me and they're looking down at the ground, they're going to have an unstable exit. They're going to potentially put us upside down. I'm going to predict that outcome, that it's going to flip us over. I'm going to determine the corrective action is to fix them in the door, bring their feet under their spine, put their head to the sky, curve their spine in the right direction, and I'm going to execute all of those corrections. I'm going to do that for my student, I'm going to do it for myself, and I'm going to do it for the relative wind, scanning those three basic components. I fix them all in the door. I've now removed the possibility of 95% of the issues I'm going to have in tandem skydiving before I deploy because I will have removed 99% of the contributing factors to a bad exit and unstable exit. Does that make sense? Is it something you guys can apply to what you're doing immediately? <coughs> yes? Okay. Hopefully you'll take this back with you and you'll share this with everybody else you work with. Fixing it in the door before you leave is much easier than fixing it out of the aircraft after you've left. All right, I don't like scary movies. I get afraid. I, I have the fear. Okay, Friday the 13th and all those other movies still give me nightmares. That kind of fear is natural and it's okay, but fear in tandem skydiving is not. You guys are pilots, no different than the pilot of Virgin Atlantic or British Airways or Delta. The only difference is it's a smaller manifest list. Instead of 150 people on board, you've got one student, one passenger. Do you think your pilots for British Airways, when they get behind the 747, are they confident in what they're doing? Or are they afraid of what they're about to do? No, they're pilots, of course they're <coughs> confident, right? You need to have the same confidence. If you have any fear, and this is another self-assessment, if you're nervous about your exits, if you're afraid of a side spin, there's no reason to be. It's not a phenomenon. We know what causes it, bad exits. We know how to fix it, scanning it and fixing it in the door. And if we still end up in a side spin, we have three ways to get out of it. The side spin procedure or setting our drogue or our reserve depending upon our orientation. So there's no reason to be afraid of it. Tandem free fall. <laughs> We have a generation of instructors who are afraid of tandem free fall, whether it's side spin, not being able to exit stable because they forgot how they were trained to do it, and they exit the aircraft and immediately throw the drogue. It's like ready, go, set. They set the drogue and then they get stable. That's not how we train our instructors and it's not how we should be exiting an aircraft. They're afraid of instability, the uprighted turtle. We've all seen this, especially out of 182s, low air speed, it's difficult to get out the door. You dive out, you roll over on your back, and you have to roll back over again, set the drogue. It creates a fear of instability. And there are some tandem instructors who are actually just afraid of being a tandem instructor. They don't like tandem skydiving. As odd as that sounds, there are instructors who do not like their job. They do it not because they want to, but because they have to. It's, it is actually a good way to make a, a decent living, especially in our sport. So there are people out there that don't even like the job they have. All of that results in fear, anxiety, and the result is, as we just saw in that video, leaving an aircraft with our right hand on the drogue. Have any of you guys <laughs> been trained in your courses, and hopefully the answer is no, um, have any of you guys been trained to exit with your right hand on the drogue? Not a single hand went up, right? But I promise you, in a room this size, there's at least one person in here somewhere. If you go back and look at your videos tonight and your self-assessment, you'll see exiting an aircraft and the right hand will immediately go down to the drogue pocket. Okay? It's an unfortunate part of where we've come as a tandem industry, but it's easily correctable. That's the good news. Just go back to what you were being trained to do in your course. So what's really sketchy about this one, their feet are still attached to the airplane. His toes are still in board of that aircraft and his right hand is on the drogue ready to set it over the tail of the aircraft. Okay, there's the tail. His hand is already on the drogue. Now this happened in the United States, but it's not just a US problem. We have a lot of problems right now. 
This isn't just one of them. You guys have this over here. This is, this is in Europe, okay? Somewhere in Europe. Same situation happening. Not a single tandem instructor that I've ever seen in a Sigma syllabus was ever trained to leave an aircraft with their hand on the drogue. This goes back to one or any combination of these fears. You think he's having a difficult time exiting the aircraft? Of course, he's leaving perpendicular to the relative wind. His student is completely de-arched and his right hand is on the drogue. Of course he's having difficulty exiting because he's not doing any of the things he was trained to do in his course to exit. But this is that new normal. I guarantee you this person was trained to exit this way, head high, neutral body position. Once they've achieved stability, set the drogue. I know the guy who trained him, so I know he was trained to do this. But today, this is the new normal. This is how he exits every aircraft. How did he get from correct to incorrect? Time, fear, and all the other factors that we talked about. So the fundamentals of our exit. Every tandem exit consists of three different processes. The setup in the door. <coughs> We showed that in the video of the side spin, how to properly set up in the door. The launch, we actually have to leave the aircraft. How do we leave the aircraft? Do we leave perpendicular? Do we leave into the relative wind? Are we pushing off with our feet? Are we turning out the door if it's a seated aircraft? But we have to physically clear the aircraft through our launch and then our flyaway. Now the flyaway is the confidence. The flyaway is you guys as tandem instructors telling the world on every one of your videos that will end up on YouTube that you know how to tandem fly your body. You can skydive with someone attached to you without a drogue. And then putting it all together. This is one of our coworkers in Florida, Sean. He's a big dude, he's tall like Kenneth. This is a Pac-750, a really small door aircraft. So if a really tall guy can crouch down in a really small door and still exit an aircraft cleanly, then the rest of us can do it too. Notice, is he oriented into the relative wind? Yep. Absolutely, you can tell by his hair, just blow him back, right? Where's his right hand? It's catching air. His right hand is where it's supposed to be. He's skydiving, he is tandem free falling right now and he's loving every one of those three to eight seconds of it. So even a little bit of a smile on his face. There's no panic. There's no need to get the drogue out as he's leaving the aircraft because he knows how to skydive. He's got confidence. He <laughs> understands how to exit an aircraft. And he's, I guarantee you, if we could go back and find one of his training videos when he became a tandem instructor 15 years ago, his exit as a tandem instructor candidate in a course was going to look almost identical to what we're seeing now today. He continues to do the same thing over and over again using all of those principles. And that's the success of a tandem instructor who understands the principles of exits and using the things he was trained in his course and not deviating from them. So one last note on the relative wind. <coughs> There's different kinds of aircraft. Relative winds can be fast in a King Air, slow in a 182, um, anywhere in between in a Twin Otter or a, a Caravan or 206. Exiting into the relative wind will make your job so much easier than exiting against it. It sounds simple to say and it's just common sense, but so many of the exits we see that are problematic are exits perpendicular to the relative wind. It just automatically makes your job harder than it needs to be. So as you're doing the self-assessment tonight, look at the relative wind and how you're choosing to enter into it. And if you have problems, if you don't know how to enter into the relative wind, it's fine. Now is the time to recognize it and fix it on the ground with your coworkers and your friends. Figure it out, talk to your examiners. Get it corrected here. Don't try to correct it up in the sky. All right, so hand cam exits. I need to talk about hand cam before I conclude this. <coughs> hand cam, we cannot disinvent the technology. We can thank our friends in Australia for introducing us to it. There's four different people in Australia that have all created hand cam. I've met each one of them. Um, but it did come from the Australia and then New Zealand uh, implemented it. And they are actually able to do it really well in Australia and in New Zealand. The rest of us are still catching up on it. 
But hand cam has destroyed our ability to exit cleanly because for one, our focus has shifted from neutral body position to making sure we catch the exit of our student's face. Placing our left hand here is not the same as keeping our arm in a neutral head high position. It increases the likelihood of an unstable exit with our left arm out. Now when we add to that the fear of tandem free fall and our right hand ends up on our drogue when we exit an aircraft, I call this the Superman exit. Okay, we're exiting aircrafts like Superman. Now if I exit an aircraft like this, my right hand is on my hip because I want the drogue and my left hand is down in front of me, what has to happen? I have to roll over because my center of gravity, my weight, the heavy, the 50 pounds of the parachute, it wants to roll over on me. So what happens? I dive out of an aircraft with a hand cam, hand on the hip, and I roll over, and I get nervous, and I throw the drogue unstable, and I rock back over again. Whew. Now I'm nervous, and I do the same thing again and again and again. So the introduction of hand cam has actually really affected our ability to exit a aircraft as a tandem cleanly because it's taking away one of our control surfaces. This is not the same as this. This is not the same as this. So head high, arms up, out in front versus left arm in front, right arm below. We've lost our control surfaces and it automatically has to invert us because we no longer have anything catching drag above our shoulders. We're going to roll over onto our back. So I'm not saying don't use hand cam. It is actually a really positive way for tandem instructors to supplement their income, which we deserve. But using a hand cam should have zero effect on your ability to do your job. Your exit should be the same whether you have a hand cam or not. Your focus should be the same whether you have a hand cam or not. Once that red light starts blinking, even the most seasoned of tandem instructors want to do what? They want to look over at the camera. If I'm looking to my left and I'm exiting to my right, which way am I going to go? To the left, I'm going to go where I'm looking. That's a basic human uh, trait. If we turn our head and look somewhere, that's where our body wants to go. If we're looking at the camera, we're going to dive towards the camera. So if you're going to choose to use hand cam, be aware of these criteria and don't let them affect how you exit. All right, jumpsuits. You guys generally jump in a very cool, cold environment here, right? Because it's the UK. If I were going to exit an aircraft right now, dressed as I am, where do I have more drag? Legs. My legs. So what's going to happen? My body's going to want to flip upside down because I'm going to have the weight of the rig from my waist to my shoulders with very little drag and a lot of drag on my legs. It's going to want me to flip upside down if I were to exit dressed like this. But that's not how I want to exit. I don't want to exit upside down. I want to exit head high, right? I want to exit head high into the relative wind. So what can I do? What have I just done? I've added drag. I now have drag on my upper body. That same exit Wow, it's getting warm in here. That same exit is going to be easier to achieve a head high neutral body position because I now have drag on my arms. So I offer you that simply because the majority of tandem instructors, especially when it gets cool out or warm out, they tend to wear t-shirts and free fly pants or t-shirts and cargo pants. And when they do that, they're making their jobs harder than it has to be. If you have less drag on your legs and more drag on your arms, you will have an easier time achieving a head high orientation because you will have more drag on your arms, more control surface, and you're taking away some of the control of the legs, allowing your legs to cut through the air faster or easier. More drag up top, less drag on the bottom, you will have an easier time exiting stable and head high. So I'm just going to run through the slide quickly. More drag equals more control. Jumping in t-shirts and shorts, you have less drag than jumping in a jumpsuit. The more drag you have, the more power you have. The more power you have to maintain your head high orientation. Who has more drag, you or your student? Who should have more drag? You. Does that always happen? 
no, can we prevent it before we get in the aircraft from happening? Every time I have a student, I should ask myself, do I have more drag than my student? And if they have more drag than I do, fix the problem before I get in the aircraft. It'll just one more step in making our job easier. Arms versus legs, I just illustrated that. My legs are larger and longer than my arms, as most of us are, hopefully. Therefore, my legs have more drag than my arms. If my goal is to keep my hips to my head above my legs when I exit an aircraft, where should I have more drag then? My arms than my legs. Very few people look at the drag dynamic difference on their own body between their arms and their legs. So at the end of the day, all of this is about controlling our center of gravity, about keeping as much weight as low as we can and keeping our shoulders and our head up to prevent rolling over. That's what the drag is for, that's what the jumpsuits are for, that's what all the exit techniques are for, is to control our center of gravity on exit. So, with a 182, there's a number of ways to exit a 182. Old school is to exit poised on the dance floor step. We've kind of moved away from that because we have a tendency to jam our reserve pack tray up into the door. It's not a good place to be. But if we separate that one problem, and it's a big one, if we separate that one problem, it's the easiest way to exit into the relative wind simply stepping back off the 182. But what we're seeing now today more though is people diving towards the tail. Diving towards the tail, arms out, feet back, and riding down the hill. That is a simple, basic technique to maintain stability on exit of a 182. What we're seeing also, which isn't as good, is the inverted, uh, inverted turtle exit where people just fall out, hope for the best, and try to deal with it after they've exited the aircraft. If you jump a 182, I'll tell you you have the hardest job in the world. It is the hardest exit to exit stable from a 182, but I would encourage you guys, fight the power. Don't give in, okay? You still can exit stable from a 182. Don't let the fact that it is a 182 distract you from the, the, the goal that you can still exit stable. Caravans, super simple. We sit on the floor and we roll 90 degrees out of the aircraft with very little energy. You guys, anyone here jump caravans? You agree? Wow, I'm gonna buy stock in Cessna. It's a very good, good aircraft for us to work with. Very easy. Rolling into the relative wind makes our job so much easier than diving towards the wing. King Air, who here jumps King Airs? I'm sorry to hear that. It's, it's a challenge to get big people out of little doors, right? And you're going 105, 110 knots to keep that thing in the air. So you get a high airspeed, small aperture to get through two bodies. It's a challenge, but the same thing can be accomplished, exiting the aircraft and turning into the relative wind. Twin otters, where's the lucky few? You guys, nobody likes these people right now. The twin otters have the easiest of anybody. You can sit on the floor, you can stand up. You have all this room to work in to assess your situation. And any guys, sky vans, any of those here in the UK? Sky van is very simple, similar to a 182. We're diving towards the tail, arms out straight, feet up on our butt so that we don't blow over, ride it down the hill, neutral, head high, set our droves. So each one of these different aircraft have a different exit. They're all dynamic. They all require different skill sets. If all I do is jump a twin otter and I show up at your drop zone to jump a 182, what should I do? I should ask some of you 182 pilots, you experienced instructors, how I do it cleanly. <coughs> There was an accident a little over a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago in Mexico, where we had a, a, a US tandem instructor, and it was actually it was a British citizen, uh, a student passenger in the front. That tandem instructor was not prepared for jumping out of a 182. There was an opportunity to train the instructor on the ground prior than going up and dealing with it at exit. Unfortunately, that opportunity was not utilized. And this instructor, who was current and skilled and used to jumping, King Airs, or sorry, Twin Otters and Caravans, was now put into a 182 for the first time. A 182 without a door, which isn't by itself a problem. A 182 without a, a step, which by itself isn't a problem. But if we start adding up all of these outcomes, we work to the point where all that's left is the incident. And unfortunately, that ended up being a double fatality. They got caught on the, the step of the aircraft. We'll never know exactly what happened because unfortunately both the plane and the tandem pair are still at the bottom of the ocean, about 2,000 feet below the, the sea level. So we'll never know exactly. We have some photos of the actual exit 
and it appears as though the student went to use the, the wheel as a step. The pilot may have taken his foot off the brake, the wheel rolled, they fell down onto the strut. Completely unnecessary. Okay. Had any of these exit techniques been used and focused on, especially getting help from those that are better than we are, that have more experience with the different aircrafts, it wouldn't have happened. But we have to be willing to ask for help and recognize Right now, I'm pretty good at exiting a sky van because we jump at skydive to land and we have one there full time. But when I first got there, I hadn't jumped one in 10 years. So I had to eat my pride and walk up to the chief instructor and say, can you give me a briefing on how to exit a sky van? And he did. And today, I have great exits out of a sky van. But we have to be willing to ask for help when we don't know what aircraft we're using and we're not familiar with it. So in conclusion, Proper training of students tends to lead towards good results. Proper setup in the door will almost always lead to positive results. Good launch, understanding how to clear the aircraft we're working from, our understanding of the relative wind, entering into the relative wind versus diving against it. All these things, one, two, three, four, can all be Practice, trained, and corrected when? Before we leave the aircraft. That's the, what I want to get across to you. You can make your job so much easier and so much more consistently successful by dealing with these before you leave the aircraft. And then confidence. We can't train confidence. We can only build it. And building confidence comes from repetition of success, repetition of successful exits over and over and over again. If you are not confident, if you lack the ability to confidently exit an aircraft, I don't expect you to stand up here and say, hi, I'm afraid, I have the fear, no. But I want you to recognize if you do have it internally, a lack of confidence, and then one-on-one, -on -one, go to your chief instructor, one-on-one, -on -one, go to your examiner, fix the problem before the next jump. Don't just keep going with a lack of confidence and hoping for the best, because eventually you're not gonna win the bet. And then fly your body. Tandem skydiving is tandem, that's two people, and skydiving. Skydiving is a part of what we do. We have to fly our body. It's not throw a drogue out the door. It's not get the drogue out as soon as we possibly can because we're afraid of exiting an aircraft. Fly your body and skydive. You're all talented skydivers, right? Anybody in here not a talented skydiver? No, of course. <laughs> You all know how to skydive. Some of you have forgotten it because you've thrown so many drogues, but remind yourself, that's why we started this. It's how we started, learning how to fly our bodies. So at the end of the day, when it comes to your exits, we're all capable of improvement. We're all capable of polishing what we do. A professional pilot does a biannual flight review. A professional tandem instructor, at a minimum, should do the same thing. For us, it can be a self-assessment, and thanks to the internet and YouTube and Vimeo and things like that, you can do it in the privacy of your own home. But I cannot emphasize enough, go home, look at your exits. Ask yourself honestly, would that exit pass the course that I took? Was I trained to exit that way? And if the answer is no, that's okay. Now is the time to recognize it. But fix it. Fix it before it becomes a problem. I don't want to investigate an incident for anyone, especially people that I get to know and that I develop relationships with. The last thing I want to do is be informed of an accident and go back and look at the last 200 jumps you made and see a bad exit after bad exit, all the mechanical things that we just addressed that we can fix and then have that be the cause of the accident. That's the most tragic thing I can think of as an accident investigator, to see something that we knew was wrong, we identified it, and we failed to correct it.